Hi, and welcome to Out of the Dark Room on Adorama TV. I'm Ruth Medjbar, and joining me on today's show is Peter Gordon. Peter is an incredible landscape photographer. He's won many prestigious awards and even published some fantastic books. Today we're going to find out just how he creates such masterful landscapes. Adorama TV presents Out of the Dark Room with Ruth Medjbar. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I hope our studio is a little bit easier to get to than maybe some of your locations. Well, it's a little bit closer than the Wicklow Mountains or the west of Ireland, but... Uh, or, you know, or the Nevada Desert. A little bit less parking out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah the you, you can't just like fly up in the car and leave it and hop yeah. out with the camera and tripod. I left my helicopter at home, I'm Not afraid. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your work then. For those that don't know it, what is it that you do? Um, well, I do, I suppose, a range of fine art photography. Um, I, all my work is project based. Um, so my most recent project that I launched was about the Burning Man Festival yeah. and a specific aspect of it. Okay. Um, and you survived Burning Man? I survived Burning Man. I went back this year again and I'm, I'm still here. So uh, yeah, wow. all good, all good. Okay. Um, and I do a range of landscape work as well, which is in various sort of thematic um, areas. That, that so so you, when you say project based, is that you setting yourself kind of an idea, an idea you might have like I want to go photograph this location and then you just take yourself off and go? Yeah, I mean I think it's, it can be about a location or an area, I think it's about trying to communicate something in a set of images, now that can be about, it could be about an area like I've done a project on Wicklow where I wanted to just show people all these different parts of Wicklow that they hadn't been to before, they hadn't been to at five o'clock in the morning maybe. Um, the Burning Man project was, I suppose, a little bit more conceptual because it was about people grieving mostly. Oh, um, okay. But um, yeah, I suppose project based just means that the set of images are tied together some way, that they're not just random yeah, sets of images. I get you. So, so tell us then a little bit more about Burning Man. I mean, you're saying it's about grieving. I think when most people think of, of Burning Man, they think of just hedonistic fun. Well, I mean, certainly there is hedonistic fun there in, <laughs> in abundance. And uh, I went for the first time in 2001 and oh. it was all about hedonistic fun and it was abundant. <laughs> the second time I went back, which was 10 years later, was in 2011 and um, I focused on a sort of a specific aspect of the festival when I went there um, and it's basically this idea called the temple um, and essentially what happens is people build a temple uh, every year at Burning Man dating back to I think 2000 and people go and leave messages on the temple walls for people who've passed away. Uh, and they also get married there, and it's kind of performing the function of a church in a way, I suppose. And then at the end of it, they burn it. You know, it's a, it's a personal turning point in some people's lives that they're going to this temple, they're leaving their messages. And these are quite like heartfelt, deep emotional kind of moments. How do you access that? How do you as a photographer kind of get in and just capture it? Because some of your pictures, I mean, you've got a bride and a groom at Burning Man, that's a very intimate moment and you've got kind of people crying and people obviously in times when it's really difficult. So how do you, you know, what, what's your process? Do you just rock up and photograph or do you wait for these? Or? I mean, I think, you know, what I would generally do is, is take the picture and then approach the person afterwards. And afterwards? Say, and okay. say, I've taken your picture, um, is that okay? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, everybody was fine and um, yeah. most people like that were upset. We had a bit of a hug afterwards in the in the Burning Man sort of spirit and, okay. and, and it was cool. This is Ruth Mejbeh for Adorama TV. Don't forget to check out Adorama's latest contest online for your chance to win some amazing prizes. Tell us a little bit then about what's it like working at Burning Man because I mean you're in the desert, um, you're in some pretty kind of you're not in a comfy studio, you don't have everything to hand. What kind of, what kind of gear would you bring with you? Um, well I mean the dust is the big thing if you kind of see the actual pictures in the book and in the project like mm. there's kind of single figures in these dust storms which is amazing photographically because it just simplifies everything shape wise but with the gear it is a bit tricky so you're not terrified then that all that dust is going to migrate into your camera and wreck everything um well what i did was i had an aquatech bag mm -hmm. which is a uh, like essentially a, a, a sealed bag uh, that allows me to access the equipment still and still shoot and um, all my cameras are are weather sealed uh, yeah. professional bodies so that helps as well I mean I brought my cameras back and I had them you know sent cleaned. off and cleaned yeah. sent them to Nikon and had them cleaned and looked at and you know there was no, okay. everything was cool nice and safe. yeah but I was I was a little bit so little what, bit what camera did you bring what camera would you have shot the majority of burning uh, well I shot 
this uh, project in 2011, so it was a D Nikon D3X. You're a Nikon uh, guy, I'm nice. I'm a Nikon okay. guy, and um, this year we went back, I shot a wedding there actually for, for a friend, and I shot it on a D800 and a D800E as well. Wow, okay, so you're a firm Nikon fan. Firm Nikon fan. And talk to me then about, about lenses, what, what would you have put on, you know, what's kind of your go-to lens in a kit bag for this? Because I presume if you're wandering around the desert, you're, you're not going to have bags upon bags hanging off you because it's roasted, it's it too is hot. hot. It is hot. I think more the thing, to be, to be honest, is you don't want to be changing lenses out there. Yeah, Because of course, the second you the open dust. it up, you know, your camera is just going to get ruined. And I think my camera survived because I didn't change lenses very yeah. often and I kept the, the Aquatech bag on it. So what I did was I had two bodies uh, and I had a 70 to 200 uh, and a 24 to 70 on, the other, on the other lenses. Nice, and solid lenses. Solid lenses. Yeah. Um, and I kind of went out a few times with my 24 mil tilt shift lens to Oh, shoot some of the buildings yeah. uh, and, and the structure itself. So would that differ then from say your, your setup if you were going into the mountains here in Ireland? Um, I would still bring similar gear. I would have yeah. another wide angle lens as well uh, and, but I would shoot a lot more with my 24 mil tilt and shift lens because I knew if I needed something I can just change lens easily where there you just can't actually change lens so you kind of need like if you said what lens, you know, one single lens yeah. you can take with you anywhere, it would always be the 24 to 70 for me because it just gives me a nice range and it's a good 2.8 lens as well. Yep, no, my uh, favourite too. Yeah. Um, so then, so Burning Man, yeah, it was definitely a project, it was an idea, but I'm thinking more of the other locations that you shoot. It always seems to be that you end up at these fabulous locations that are composed really, really well at the most perfect time of day. Now that's simplifying it, but Tell us about how you get from picking a location to shooting it. I mean, what goes into it? How much, how much patience and process and planning goes into that? I mean, I think a lot of planning does go, into, does go into the locations that I shoot. I mean, you need to return again and again a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'm working on a series of work at the west of Ireland and, you know, I might head down to Kerry for four or five days and come back with no pictures, but I'll have kind of seen different places and have ideas for pictures in my mind. I think a big part of any photographic process, whether it's landscape or otherwise, is that you pre-visualize what's going to happen afterwards and you have yeah. a, a sense, you know, not just of turning up somewhere, but of, you know, what's going to go on a piece of paper, I think, so more you, than a you screen. think of the finished project, but yeah, like the finished yeah, so image I, after. Um, so does that in a way affect how you shoot? Because if you're thinking of this is going to go into a book and you've had two books published as well, one on Burning Man and one on, in, on Wicklow as well. So do, when you're out there and you're shooting and you know, it could be raining, it could be freezing and you could be standing there for hours, are you thinking that this is going to look perfect in this book? Or are you thinking for an exhibition or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think, you're, I, think you, I definitely have an idea in my mind of what the finished picture will look like yeah. and you're going there hoping for something uh, to happen but ultimately sometimes the light dictates okay. something else and I certainly would respond you know yeah. to different things happening with different lighting conditions um, but I think if you go there with some sort of conceived idea of what you're looking for then you're much more likely to to come out with something interesting you, I never kind of box myself into one thing but at the same time it's you know the planning does yeah. Most definitely help. And like, I mean, I'm sure the light changes, and that's completely out of your control. But um, but but when you are shooting, I, I mean, a lot of our viewers here are, are probably aiming to do what you're doing. You know, they're, they're, we've a lot of uh, photographers that would love to be a landscape photographer full time professionally. Yeah. Um, would there be anything that you could say to them that you know? Any tips that you've learned? Get out of bed <laughs> really, of really, really Is early. Is it all about getting up early? You no, know, I mean, it's definitely being able to get up early yeah. like helps. But I mean, I'd never like, make it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's like I've stopped shooting that much in the summer these days because it's just so ridiculously early. And in Ireland, you just get absolutely mangled by the midgets at the side of a lake oh, at no. five o'clock in the morning. So, so that's something you've learned along I've the way. I've learned along the way. I'm more of an autumn shooter these days. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, like definitely getting up early is really important in terms of getting the best light. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, being able to master the basic technical attributes of your camera is something that, you know, when I teach workshops and things like yeah. that, people will struggle with initially. And then once you've mastered those sort of basics, it's about how you interpret the light that you see and how you shape the, the picture in terms of your, your composition. So, Certainly being there at six just, in the morning be there, is really. very important. Yeah. But you know, ultimately, you know, when we take tours away, we have eight 
people understanding beside each other and they come away with different pictures. So, oh, wow, uh, okay. Very different pictures. So, yeah. I suppose maybe, it, I mean, it's all in the eye. You see things differently than everyone else does. But, I mean, for you, I mean, was that trained? Did you, did you learn that in college or how did you come to be a photographer? Uh, well, my dad is actually a, a photographer as well. So um, He's part of the duo that you're in, right? Yeah, Explore Life. exactly, exactly. Yeah. We do it together. So, um, I was fortunate when I, I actually studied something completely different in college and then when I finished college I kind of had the choice of whether I pursue photography or uh, a career in history basically kind of an okay. academic career but um, like I was able to ask him any questions that ever sort of sprung to mind uh, yeah. which is a very fortunate position to be in um, and then a lot of it was just actually being outside and wow. and learning through you know shooting loads of transparency film like I shot everything on film like I mean the quality you get from your images even from the Burning Man images in particular I mean there's quite a filmic quality to them I thought they were shot on film because you know there's something about film that just has a different color and depth to it Definitely. that you don't really get in digital but um I mean how did you how do you make that how, do, how did you make digital almost look like film well I think I suppose for the Burning Man work for me I jumped straight into actually from like Velvia, Provia, Astia, yeah. and those transparency uh, Fuji films, um, and um, I don't know. Did it? I process things on how I see this. I don't like. So you're you're like, doing it in Photoshop. I'm or doing it in Photoshop, but yeah. I but I process everything by eye. Like people are always like when I teach photography, sometimes yeah. people are asking me, you know, why it, is there is there is there a specific you know yeah. workflow? And there is a workflow. I mean, everything you know flows from white balance for me. That's the first thing I always adjust, and I get that correct. And everything that happens okay. afterwards comes from that point. So are you almost kind of going back to the scene in your head and saying, well, actually, it wasn't that warm. It was a little bit colder. Or I'm processing on the basis of color, definitely, yeah. in terms of what everything will happen afterwards, in terms of contrast, or if you have clarity, or anything like that, will all lead from that initial point. But I'm not going back to the scene in my mind. I'm going back to what I feel looks good. OK. Um, I don't so it's your, um, your interpretation of what yeah. was there, I suppose. Yeah, you're yeah, not a documentary photographer. You're yeah. a fine art photographer. Yeah, so yeah. I don't think, I don't think you know, it necessarily has to be be absolutely true to what yeah. you saw. Equally, I don't kind of like to grab, you know, Thursday's moon and drop it into Sunday's you know, that's, Sunday's yeah, Sunday morning that's picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. And when you're in the field, then do you use anything that would help in the post production? I mean, you must use ND filters and, and things like that yeah, as well. Yeah, I use a lot of filters for my landscape work um, do because I don't. I prefer to kind of get it in one frame if I can, yeah. um, and that's not a right or wrong thing, like you can obviously blend in Photoshop yeah. multiple exposures for skies. I get more enjoyment out of it if I've actually got it okay. in the can when this it's is, happening, okay. um, and I'll change white balance when I'm out in the yeah. scene as well, um, and it just makes me feel more fulfilled about it, and I just really think that if you feel more fulfilled about the pictures that you're taking, that you actually make better pictures. Uh, okay. So. Um, so I use graduated neutral density filters. Yeah. Um, I use um, one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, soft and hard. And then I have six stop uh, solid NDs and 10 yeah. stop solid NDs as well. And I have a polarizer. <laughs> and I have a polarizer. Just, just to, just you got quite the kit up. back then. I mean, they're probably essential though, right? For a landscape photographer. Well, they're to definitely have all that gear. essential for holding in your skies in terms of the graduated neutral density yeah. filters. Um, again, you know, you can shoot one for the sky and one for the foreground, but um, if you want to hold yeah. that detail in the sky in one frame, you definitely need a graduated filter. And if anyone's thinking of, you know, purchasing uh, filters like that, I would recommend a 0.6, or a, which is a two-stop hard filter, okay. or a 1.2 soft filter. Well, that's brilliant. I mean, we'll put the links to filters and stuff so yeah. people can find them easily. But that's yeah. a great little tip to have then. And um, tell me then, because I know you don't, you're changing everything in the camera there, and you want to get everything in the camera. But is there ever a time where you change something in the scene in front of you? Do you use any artificial lighting, or is there anything that you would move around? Or Well, the new project that I'm working on is all about artificial light actually. You can tell us all about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we just led into that nicely. So yeah. um, like in work, you know, up to this point, I haven't used any artificial lighting. Okay. Um, I have processed things in a way uh, like the Burning Man stuff where I've used some bleach dyeing and things like that in oh, the wow. post-production. Yeah. But uh, in terms of the actual scene, nothing had been added. Um, I suppose I found myself, to be honest, uh, being down in Wicklow, which is the area I made the first book about, and enjoying being there, but not having any real desire to actually take pictures there anymore. Because it's uh, kind of been done, I suppose. Yeah, you did and it. I just I did it, and there was there's so many pictures taken there, and um, so I kind of 
still really loved the place uh, and wanted to, you know, still photograph it, but I, I wasn't sure how. So I went down there at about three o'clock in the morning with lights not too dissimilar than we have around us here, um, okay. basically LED video lighting, yeah. uh, and started lighting up the forest uh, in the middle of the night with um, LED lights in the mist and stuff like that. So that's my my new. That's, that's my new project is called in lights. a different light in a different <laughs> light well listen thanks so much and i'm really looking forward to seeing um the, the more of your backlit shots and your artificial light shots they're going to be fantastic and uh, don't get lost in namibia or bolivia or anything because we we need to see more of your stuff okay thank, thank you Rick. thanks so thanks much Cheers. Cheers. Thank, thank you, you. thanks well, that's it for this episode. Join me again on Out of the Dark Room when I'm going to be chatting to more great photographers. They're going to be sharing with me and you some of their tips and tricks on how to get some great photography. Bye for now. Do you want great looking prints at low cost? Be sure to visit our easy to use online printing service. Adorama Pix has professionals who treat your images with the utmost care that you can count on. For a quick turnaround on photos, cards, or albums, use adoramapix.com.